what does it feel to be back in Santa Barbara, this time to receive the Kirk Douglas Award for Excellence in Film? Is there a word for like beyond honored? What's, what's beyond honored? Uh, you. Okay, that's what I am. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing to be. I love this festival and it's just incredible to be here and be, be given this. I mean, Kirk, Kirk Douglas is such a, you know, an acting hero of mine and it's really, it's pretty special. Can you talk a little bit about taking on the role of a pop culture icon like Ken? <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, God, it was, it was uh, one hell of a ride, you know? I mean, w at one moment I was sort of, you know, building a Barbie's dream house in my, you know, for Christmas, and then the next, like six months later, I was, I was in it, and it was real, and this whole, like, incredible universe had been realized by Greta and Margo, and, you know, my kids, um, you know, Barbie landed at my house all at the same time, so it was just kind of, the, the script and just Barbies in general, so it was uh, an amazing opportunity to sort of, you know, work on something that they were interested in, and um, just to work on something that was so brilliant as well, and such brilliant people. Was it kind of your renaissance? It was, wow, nicely done. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at a lot of your film clips, going way back. What are you most li looking forward to seeing again, revisiting? Any particular time period? I'm trying to uh, not think about that. I might, <laughs> might close my eyes. Um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing Steve and Greta. And it just means a lot to me that they're here. And you know, I can't think of two more talented and gracious people. So it's exciting. This is really shaping up to be a huge year for you. Can you talk about uh, the Fall Guy? Oh yes, the Fall Guy is just what a so much fun, uh, incredible working with David Leach and Emily Blunt. Such an incredible cast, and you know, just David Leach is a stunt, you know, person started as one, and and obviously he's now this incredible director. But it just, you know, the story comes from such an authentic place because he's had a sort of a window into making movies, you know, that only he has, and so the film just has this kind of really special, unique perspective, and it's such a love letter, not just to stunts, but just to all the people who make films, and... Yeah, the, the, the trail is amazing. Oh, Thank great. You. Thank you. My name is Roger Derling. I'm the executive director of the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, and um, I'm so glad to see all of you tonight. Um, before I continue speaking, we would like to thank Rare Champagne for providing their extraordinary, um, they're providing their extraordinary Rare Rosé 2014 tonight. Uh, Forbes just voted it the best champagne in the world. So um, drink up. Um, it's also the official champagne of the Oscars. Um, um, today, Today marks the second ceremony of the Kirk Douglas Award for Excellence in Film since the passing of the film legend that was Kirk Douglas. Um, he was a great friend of the festival and we will always treasure his friendship and him allowing us to name the ceremony after him so we um, could raise funds for our, our educational programs. Um, we're indebted to him forever. Thank you, Kirk. Um, and um, as some of, of you may know, Kirk was very hands-on about picking the honorees uh, that receive his namesake award. And although he wasn't involved in the process of selecting tonight's honoree, I know for certain that he would approve. Um, I can totally picture uh, Kirk Douglas sharing his favorite drink a dry vodka martini with Ryan Gosling. Um, and, and telling him that he was good as Ken, but that he, Kirk, should have played a part. Um, thanks for being here, uh, Ryan, to let us salute you. Um, I, was, um, I was so impressed when I saw Ryan's first leading film role in the 2001 film, uh, The Believer, written and directed by Henry Bean. Um, in it, Ryan plays Daniel Ballant, a Jew who becomes a neo-Nazi. And in it, 
uh, Ryan mixes this kinetic physical energy with intelligence to create a frighteningly uh, complex and volatile character. Um, what Ryan does in The Believer is uncompromising and brilliant. Um, Todd McCarthy, the lead critic of Variety, felt that his dynamite performance in The Believer could scarcely have been better, and, and I agree. Um, I remember thinking uh, when I saw the film that here was this young Marlon Brando reborn. Um, that was an auspicious beginning, and what came after, and of course, um, it didn't disappoint. Um, he soon became a bona fide leading man and a heartthrob in the notebook. Uh, he achieved further, further critical acclaim starring in Half Nelson in, in 2006, where he plays a self-destructive history teacher at a Brooklyn school. Um, it is a mesmerizing character study that earned him his first Oscar nomination for Best Actor. He's both, in Half Nelson, he's both alluring and pitiful in the film. Um, his character says, says in the film, um, history is a study of the way opposing forces interact over time. He could be describing his own performance, as well as his career to follow, where he will contrast independent films with big budgets. Um, it's, it's hard for me to think of another contemporary actor who has a mass more electrifying and eclectic parade of characters than Ryan Gosling. Um, just, to, just to pick a few career highlights, in Lars and the Real Girl, he plays an awkward young man who falls in love with an anatomically correct sex doll. Um, in Blue Valentine, he co-stars uh, with Michelle Williams in the emotionally devastating examination of a marriage. In Crazy Stupid Love, he's, he's dashing and cool and proves so nimble in comedy, he steals the film from Steve Carell in, in, in yeah. Um, and then in Drive, he becomes the new Steve McQueen. Um, then he collaborates twice with Damien Chazelle. Uh, first in La La Land, where, where Ryan show, showed us he can sing, he can dance like an old Hollywood musical star. Um, earning him his second Oscar nomination for Best Actor. Um, he won a Golden Globe uh, for his efforts as well. And then First Man, a biopic about Neil Armstrong. Um, I reached out to Damien Chazelle, uh, who couldn't be here tonight, and he told me this about Ryan. Ryan's an actor of such sensitivity, such quicksilver magic and depth of feeling. It is a gift for any director to work with him. He makes you a better filmmaker. For me, he's the heir to the 70s, generation of Hackman, Hoffman, Pacino, De Niro, Duval, Nicholson. Ryan is as capable of, of being truly present and alive when the cameras are rolling. Plus, an extra blessing of this past year was getting to watch the world discover how damn funny he is. I couldn't be happier for him uh, getting this award tonight. Hopefully one day, if I'm lucky, I'll get to work with him again. And then, uh, this is me now speaking again, and there, then here comes 2023. 2023 and Ryan goes all out and becomes the, spe the biggest special effect in the cultural phenomenon, phenomenon that is Barbie. Directed by, the directed by the magician Greta Gerwig. She's here tonight. By the way, is there anything this talented director cannot do? Um, 
Barbie is a triumph. Congrats, Greta, on your well-deserved Director Gill Award nomination this week. Um, and thanks for unleashing the Kennergy. Um, Ryan is pitch perfect in Barbie. Perfect comedic timing, vulnerable, and he's seemingly having the time of his life. So much that it becomes so infectious for us all. Uh, so much that I think the movie should have been called Ken. Uh, and, and, and with all that talk about his infinite talents, I forgot to acknowledge how good looking Ryan Gosling is. Um, I invite you to all to take a look at this montage with Bill to salute one of the best actors working in cinema today. Enjoy. <clears throat> <clears throat> Ryan Gosling is a delightful guy. <laughs> He's polite. He tends to keep to himself. He's professional. He's respectful of others. There are many, many nice things that I could say about Ryan Gosling, but uh, that's not why we're all here this evening. <laughs> Tonight I'd like to ask the question, why do I hate Ryan Gosling? <clears throat> sure, Ryan Gosling seems like a delightful guy. He seems like the perfect family man slash actor slash movie star. He seems like the type of person who would be singled out for an award like this. But unfortunately, Santa Barbara got it wrong. <laughs> Again. Let me tell you a little story. When Ryan and I were working together on Crazy Stupid Love, you just saw, <clears throat> it was the end of a shooting week and we were standing outside our trailers and uh, we were getting ready to leave for the weekend and talking about what our weekend plans would be. And I was going to be spending uh, a quiet evening and weekend with my family. And Ryan told me that his band had a gig that evening. Where, I asked. A senior center in Glendale, he replied. <laughs> He was going to spend his Friday night playing music for some old folks in Glendale. Yeah, isn't that just adorable? <laughs> now, a movie star would have told that story on a talk show, would have used it, would have gotten some juice out of it, monetized it. Maybe it goes viral as a, a gif or a meme. Hashtag Ryan at the Senior Center. But not Ryan Gosling. He did it just to make some old folks happy. And I find that annoying as hell. <laughs> Coincidentally, I now live at that very senior center. And every week I hope he comes back, but he's too busy now. Did you know that Ryan Gosling is from Canada? Home of the sweet and innocuous. <laughs> Did you know that he once saved a woman from being hit by a taxi? Saved a dog from being run over on a highway? De-escalated violent confrontations between total strangers? Drove to New Orleans to help in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina? Did you know that the only reason we know that he did any of these things is that someone else witnessed him doing these things. Ryan Gosling doesn't advertise his good deeds and I choose to view that as a flaw. <laughs> Some people find him moderately handsome. <laughs> but I don't know, not my type. When I worked with him, he was actually very embarrassed that everyone was making such a fuss over his godlike physique. He would say, I only worked out because my character works out. Break. <sighs> Have you seen any of Ryan Gosling's work? Lars and the Real Girl. He was great in it. 
The Nice Guys, fantastic. Barbie, Place Beyond the Pines, Big Short, The Notebook, excellent, fantastic, sublime, an incredibly diverse body of work. Time after time, he makes interesting, creative choices. He's not driven by fame or money or status. What a fucking asshole. <laughs> What makes it worse is that it is genuine. He is a genuinely nice person. He makes other actors who are pretending to be nice, like me, look like insincere piles of garbage. Well, thank you, Mr. Gosling. Now, you might think that this is some sort of comedic bit. Pretending to despise Ryan Gosling when I actually love him. Wrong again, Santa Barbara. <laughs> no, actually, part of that is true. I am pretending to despise Ryan Gosling for comedic effect. But do I love Ryan Gosling? Well, love is a very powerful, very strong word. I reserve that word for my wife and for my children. But here is the truth, I do. I do love Ryan Gosling. I love him more than my wife and my children. <laughs> he is smart and intuitive and funny. He is a joy to be around. And most of all, and this is a big one for me, he is kind. Santa Barbara, you actually got this one very right. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone, and thank, you, and thank you for this beautiful evening. So, there is no one that I would rather be giving a speech about than Ryan Gosling. He is so outrageously talented, it's hard to know exactly where to begin. Also, I am very glad that this is a speech because maybe the only thing that he is terrible at is getting compliments because he dances away from them and somehow does a shuffle ball change and a time step and suddenly I am the one who is receiving a compliment which is deeply charming and also deeply frustrating because somehow I've never been able to fully communicate how incredible he is. But I'm going to try now, and he can't stop me. <laughs> um, I love, and everyone loves, referencing other actors when I talk about Ryan, because he is such a delicious and to totally unexpected combination of genius. He has the burning intensity of Marlon Brando. He has the exquisite comedic pain of John Barrymore. The tragic realism of Montgomery Clift, Clift and the virtuosic showmanship of John Travolta and the sly wit of Gene Wilder. <laughs> but because the, this is the Kirk Douglas Award, I, of course, started to think about the brilliance of Kirk Douglas and what I believe his connection is to Ryan Gosling. In an incredible career, two of my favorite Kirk Douglas performances are in Billy Wilder's Ace in the Hole as uh, a lethally ambitious newspaper man and in Vincent Minnelli the bad and the beautiful as a charismatically toxic movie producer. They are fully committed portraits that never, not even for one second, provide Kirk Douglas, the actor, any safety inside them. He never sells out his characters. He never tries to make them tamer or less extreme. That same thing is true of Ryan Gosling. He doesn't create a distance between himself and his characters. He never winks at the audience 
to tell them that he, Ryan Gosling, is standing apart from what is ridiculous or embarrassing or mean or petty or heroic or base. He allows it all to exist within him and he never hedges. My theory about Kirk Douglas and my theory about Ryan is they both commit in such a way to characters in all their beauty and their ugliness because they are actors and people who believe that redemption is possible. This is hopeful and this is needed. If you don't believe in the possibility of redemption, you would never show people in all their complexity. It is a philosophical position articulated through acting. And in doing so, it provides a possibility for us all as audience members. I don't really play poker, so this could be wrong, what I'm about to say. <laughs> but I know that there's a thing when one person puts in all their chips, and if you want to keep playing, you also have to put in all of your chips. And anyway, that's what it's like to work with Ryan Gosling. <laughs> All, all his chips are in at every moment, and if you want to keep playing, you better ante up. There's nothing he can't do. He can sing, he can dance, he can act, he can play guitar, he can play piano, he can plant trees, he can write gorgeous prose, compose music, light a scene, talk about obscure films, make everyone laugh, be kind to people's parents, and on top of it all, he has beautiful handwriting. <laughs> I've never met someone that understood what I'm trying to do so quickly. After sending him the script, he and I got on the phone, and from the moment we started talking, he just understood. Noah Baumbach and I had written the part of Ken for Ryan, and there would be no Barbie if he hadn't come to be our Ken. And somehow, he knew exactly what the role required instantly. Once he was in, it was a commitment beyond anything I could have dreamed. Ryan and I spent hours and hours talking and texting and agonizing about Ken and Barbie and what they mean and what drives them and what we were doing. And at first, I felt the need to apologize to him, to say, I'm sorry, we're having a deep philosophical conversation about Ken. <laughs> but as time went on, I realized I, I didn't need to caveat anything. He thought it was important. He knew it was important. I think as girls, we always take our games and our toys to be less important because the world historically has treated them as less important. Boys' games and toys have always had corresponding adult versions that are important. Army men, trucks, building materials, the games boys play are affirmed as having value in the adult world while princesses and Barbies and tea parties and playing moms or playing house are seen as not important. Now, I don't, I don't know if this is because he has daughters or because of his amazing wife or because he was raised by a wonderful mom, but Ryan never for one moment doubted the value of the interior lives of girls. By bringing his immense talent, his passion, his dedication, his total commitment to Ken and to Barbie, he's saying, this matters. The dream life and the playtime and the inner world of girls matter. They are not less than, they deserve the best and the biggest of what I have to offer. He's co-signing this importance by his commitment and by his presence and by his art. I don't know that I've ever quite been as happy as when I've been watching him act. I think people talk about being seen, and that was my experience. I've never felt more seen than by his performance. The sequence where he's in the battle, and in the midst of the battle, he breaks out into song, and then he beaches off, and then 
he goes into a dream ballet. Well, that's just my whole soul on display in the guise of a male actor portraying a doll. I don't know how that's possible, but it's true. What I'm trying to say is this. As bananas as it sounds, I feel more than a little bit saved by Ryan's acting, by working with him and by watching him work. I have felt the same way sitting in an audience watching his other performances in films that I had nothing to do with, and I felt it a hundredfold watching him as he invents and inhabits a character in front of me. I could not think of a more perfect person to present to Ryan. Kirk Douglas to Ryan Gosling, genius to genius. Thank you to the Santa Barbara International Film Festival for recognizing him. emotionally prepared for tonight. <laughs> uh, although I'm not sure how I could have prepared. Well, I should have had more champagne. That's what I should have done. That's, that's something I could have done. Um, <laughs> if I knew that Steve and Greta uh, were going to be, I knew they would be great, but if I knew they were going to be this great, so charming, so smart, so gracious, so funny. I might have just suggested that maybe I open the night <laughs> and they close and then we end on a high note. Uh, but here we are. Um, I'm getting the Kirk Douglas Award somehow. <laughs> uh, it's hard to imagine being at a point in my career where I'm standing up here tonight. It's, uh, you know, hard to feel deserving of all of this. But I remind myself that uh, the proceeds go to a wonderful cause, so it doesn't really matter if I deserve it or not. <laughs> that makes me feel better. <laughs> it's just, you know, that it's Kirk Douglas. He's one of the first true icons of cinema. He not only made some of the best films of his time, but some of the best films of all time, films that stood the test of time and will continue to stand the test of time, and that is too many times to say time. <laughs> the point but the point is that he is uh, completely and utterly in a class of his own, and I'm just Ken. <laughs> <clears throat> and this honor is for a contribution to cinema. I mean, up until this point, uh, I've only ever thought about just how much cinema had done for me. I had never really thought about what I've done for cinema. Like, as far back as I can remember, for instance, when I was in the third grade, I had a swearing problem. <laughs> and uh, I didn't think it was a problem, <laughs> but my teachers did. And, you know, I just thought they were being a bunch of uptight mother, wait. <laughs> not tonight, not tonight. I thought that they were being, you know, things that should never be uttered in, in a wonderful setting, such, such as this. My mother said it was almost impossible to get me to stop, but I remember the night she figured it out. We were at the dinner table and she said, if you swear one more time, <laughs> you can't watch any movies tonight. And uh, I thought that was extreme, so, you know, I used some extreme language back. She said, okay, now you can't watch movies for a week. Well, since she had up the ante, so did I. I hit her with a quick flurry of my favorites. 
And then I dropped an F-bomb, just for good measure. She said, okay, well now you can't watch movies for a month. It wasn't until that exact moment that I realized just how much movies meant to me. It was the worst moment of my young life at that point. Right away, I was deep with withdrawals, lying awake on my sweat-soaked mattress <laughs> on those cursed filmless nights. My skin was crawling, hallucinations of blockbuster employees on my ceiling waving VHS tapes at me. <laughs> It was like train spotting, except instead of diving into a toilet, I was just trying to crawl inside my VCR. <laughs> she found my weak spot. She knew it. And soon after that, she took me out of school and homeschooled me for a year. You know, with all the swearing and the not being able to read and write very well, I guess she figured <laughs> that she couldn't do much worse. <laughs> So part of her curriculum was weekly visits to the library to check out books, books I had no intention of reading. She had a solution for that too. The library had a collection of films and uh, she made a deal with me that uh, for every book I read, I could rent a movie. Now you can imagine that a small town in a public library in Canada was no blockbuster, but I wasn't complaining. I'd take whatever I could get. So I ended up watching whatever they had, which seemed to always be either the Ten Commandments, <laughs> Samson and Delilah, uh, Abbott and Costello's Hold That Ghost, A Hard Day's Night, Planet of the Apes, and Spartacus. I watched them on a loop. I also got my hands on a bootleg copy of Overboard. <laughs> that my sister had taped at a friend's house, which I worked into the rotation because it had a few curse words and I just wanted to stay true to my roots, you know? <laughs> I thought I was being very clever by using them as a distraction from my education, but in retrospect, I realized that they were an integral part of my education. The directors, Cecil B. DeMille, Arthur Lubin, Jean Christophe Avarti, Franklin J. Schaffner, Gary Marshall, and Stanley Kubrick were kind of like substitute teachers. The actors, Charlton Heston, Yul Brenner, Edgar G. Robinson, Hedy Lamar, Abbott and Costello, the Andrew Sisters, the Beatles, Goldie Hawn, Kurt Russell, and the great Kirk Douglas became sort of de facto classmates. They were the only people I hung out with other than my mom. And uh, we would go on these kind of field trips to ancient Egypt, Rome, London, Hollywood, and Alien Planet. And as far as I could tell in Overboard, uh, they're somehow on a yacht in Elk Cove, Oregon. <laughs> and yes, they were expanding my horizons, but they were also teaching me how to dream or how to dream bigger anyway. Those film experiences, uh, those, that whole experience, the filmmakers, the actors creating their own stories, my mother taking me out of school to show me how to create my own story. Even at an early age, film had opened a door that led to a world where daydreaming didn't mean you were wasting time, it meant that you were doing your job. A job I could not wait to do, a job I started doing right away. You know, if you count putting on hammer pants and dancing at the mall, <laughs> or <laughs> singing when a man loves a woman uh, at weddings to brides during the garter belt ceremony. <laughs> but I got paid 20 bucks a song, you know, Canadian. <laughs> so it was like 1490 American. <laughs> but it was better than nothing. And uh, it led me to my big next move which was uh, being the least talented kid in a group of Disney Channel prodigies on the Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> and sure, I lived in a trailer park in Kissimmee, Florida, in a mobile home with a gas leak, and I was tired all the time because of the propane inhalation. <laughs> but I was also one step closer to an even bigger move which was wearing leather pants as a scrawny kid version of Kevin Sorbo and Young Hercules. <laughs> a 
okay, so that door, you know, that open door wasn't uh, an elevator that went straight to the top, but uh, I was able to help my mom pay the rent. And by playing other people, I was learning who I was in the process. I also learned that I didn't just want to do the job anymore. I, I wanted to at least try to be great at it. And it seemed to me the only way to do that was to try and work with people who were great at it already. People like Greta Gerwig and Steve Carell. Now it's difficult for me to overstate how much it means to me that they are here tonight. I honestly cannot think of two more gracious and more talented people. I wrote this before I heard Steve's speech, so. <laughs> and they are uh, also, in a way, they're sort of bookends of my career so far. I was 17 on my first job in Hollywood when I met a young Stephen John Carell. Or is it Carol? Is it Carol or Carell? Carelli? Oh. We didn't have scenes together, so I went to set one day to watch him work. He was so damn funny that the boom operator dropped the boom to hold his ribs. That's how hard he was laughing. It's the first and only time I've ever seen someone be so good it was a problem. But what was making us all laugh wasn't scripted. It was Steve improvising. And not just breaking character and clowning around, the opposite actually. It was all still in character. It was all the best ways a scene could evolve if a character was really going for every single little bit of life that the scene would allow. And I realized that I wasn't going to be enough for me to just go to work and say my lines anymore. To even try and operate at Steve's level, I would have to create a whole world of, for my characters, one that was beyond the page, and be ready to invite others into it at any moment. And even if you never get to share it, you still know it's there. So after watching Steve work in only one scene, I had learned this incredible secret. Well, it was a secret, I guess I just shared it, so. <laughs> Is that okay, Steve? I don't know. You never said it was a secret, so I just, uh, is that fine? In fact, you've never shared any secrets with me, which is weird, you know? It's like, what are you hiding? <laughs> and I don't even know where to start with Greta. Even though she was making one of the biggest films of all time, against all the odds in the world, she never allowed the weight of the task to steal the joy away from the moment. She never let the importance of it all cloud what was truly important, which is to never forget how lucky we are to do what we do. I, for one, have been so lucky. I've gotten to go to the moon, be a motorcycle bank robber, a getaway driver, waltz through the stars, be an elementary school teacher, albeit a crack addicted one. <laughs> Become a replicant from the future, a gangster from the past, a lovelorn stuntman, and most recently, thanks to Greta, a 70-year-old crotchless doll. <laughs> but most importantly, I got to meet the girl of my dreams, Ava Mendez. and have two dream children. I dreamed of one day making movies and now movies have made my life a dream. So the way I see it, uh, there's no way I've contributed half as much to cinema as cinema has contributed to me. But the idea that I might have given something back to the thing that has given so much to me is uh, too great an honor for me to express I do want to express my deep thanks to some of the people that have been instrumental in getting me here tonight. My mom, my older sister Mandy, Eileen Feldman and Carolyn Govers, Brian Lord, Ida Zanidi, Robin Baum, Robert Offer, Chris Angulo, Mark Avery, Henry Bean, Derek C. in France, Ryan Fleck and Anna Bowden, Nick, Nick Cassavetes, Greta Gerwig, 
and Stephen John Carell. And thank you to the Santa Barbara Film Festival for this very special honor and for letting me say all of this. And I did it all without swearing. <laughs> Not even once. So I guess my mom was the big winner tonight. Thank you so much.